so we left Utah and um, we went to, we were in Missouri for a little bit and we were in Idaho and then we moved back to our home state. Um, and, um, you know, that was another thing thing that I think is kind of crazy about the about the church is um, when we were in Idaho, we didn't really care for our ward. And instead of going to a different congregation, we had to sell our house. You know, what church does that? Like, who has to sell their house so they can go to another congregation? And so that was an experience that we had in Idaho. But we, so we ended up coming back to our home state. And we thought, we knew the craziness um, in our home state, but um, we thought, you know, it's been 10 years. We we're sealed in the temple, we have kids, we have a good family, you know, maybe if people just saw that our family is just great, uh, none of that stuff will, will matter. And you'd be near both your, both your parents, right? Yes, yeah. His uh, well, his are... family, no, his family moved to Utah, so they okay. were no longer okay. here. Okay. And then my biological parents live about four hours from here. Um, and so we moved back into his home ward, Right. And my home ward is is about an hour away. We grew up in the same stake, okay. but our wards are an hour apart. So he was where he grew up, and you yes, were where we you grew up. Yes, we both were. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so um, so shortly after we moved in, I was put in the um, Young Women's Presidency as the second counselor. And that was when things kind of got really crazy. Um so our ward has always had the reputation that we had three bishops that were excommunicated. Uh, two bishops were for adultery. And the third bishop I had always thought was for adultery as well. And so when people would make comments about him, I'd be like, oh, don't judge. You know, this is an incredible family. They had, his wife is a saint and his children are amazing. Um, and so I was always very defensive of that, you know, because adultery, it's not a good thing, but it's also two consenting adults. And, uh, and so, I thought, you know, he made a mistake and his fam his wife was able to forgive him. And so, you know, good things. And having and, been branded a harlot, I'm sure you were sympathetic oh, yeah. to other people Absolutely. Being, <laughs> being sex shamed, right? Absolutely. Okay. So and, just to be clear, you move into a ward where three successive bishops were excommunicated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. That's got to be and crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. And the whole stake, um, they, ref <laughs> they refer to our ward as the armpit of the stake. <laughs> it's like a, a, mini, a mini Babylon, you know, like – um, there's not a lot of gospel found here. It's about, it's about your boat. Do you own a one engine boat or a two engine boat? How big is your house? What's your title in the church? How much money do you make? That's kind of how things go here. Um, and so, uh, not a lot about the savior <laughs> or the gospel, uh, but it was okay. Cause we were home. So we were, you know, happy to be home. Um, but so I got put in the young women's presidency. And um, so there are two families in our ward. So there is the bishop that was excommunicated, and we can call him Bishop Young. And then there is the family that was involved in this situation, and I'll call them the Smiths. Um, so I have my first presidency meeting, and I'm learning about the different girls. Um, because this I'm is how long ago? This is how long ago? Uh, about? about a month ago. A little, a, a okay, little so over, now a few months to, ago. We're no, up to a, a few yeah. months ago now. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and, and you're so, new, are you new to this ward? Yes, I've never been in this ward. I'm familiar with it, but I've never been in it. Okay, so you just moved back to this area. It's my husband's home ward, not my home A few months ward. ago. Um, well, yeah, about seven months ago, we moved okay. in here. Yeah. From, from an out of state? Yes. Okay, yeah. so wow, I didn't realize that. So seven months yeah. ago, you you moved back to your home state, into this area, into this home ward, mm -hmm. where three successive bishops have been excommunicated. You're called in the young women's. Okay, seven months ago, yeah. what happens? All right. Um, so I have my first presidency meeting, and we're going over all the girls, and we have to learn everyone's story. Um, and... Um, I have a girl on my list. Her last name is Smith. And so she is from this family. And that's that's a, a fake Smith. name. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the Smith family. And and she's 12. Okay. So she's, you know, essentially this bishop, he committed adultery 18 years ago. Bishop Young. 
Bishop Young, 18 okay. years ago, committed adultery. Um, or so you thought. So, or so you thought. Yes. So I thought. And um, so I asked about her. I said, oh, I know this family. You know, what, what are we doing to reach out to her? And the secretary in the presidency, she reached over my arm. And she's very close with Bishop Young and his family. And she reached over my arm and she crossed off her name. And she said, oh, you know, she's a Smith. You don't really, you don't really have to worry about the Smiths. And I was like, what? And uh, she said, well, they don't really understand the atonement. And I was like, oh, okay. And I'm still thinking adultery, you know. And so, because the rumor is that he had an affair with a member of the Smith family. Um, and so I'm thinking, oh, I don't really agree with that. And the president's like, yeah, you know, we've made contact with them. And, you know, you just have to move on. And I said, yeah, but are we moving on because they asked us not to bother them or for some other reason? And they said, well, you know, they, they don't come to church because of the whole situation with the youngs. I still don't know what's going on. And I don't. I feel like I can press further. Um, but at this time, I am, I'm incredibly devout LDS. And so when I see her cross this name off, I'm thinking as, as this being a soul that is being crossed off. And so my heart is just broken. And I come home from that meeting and I tell my husband, I'm just in tears. And I'm like, they crossed her name off. She wasn't even alive when this was going on. And and I was just so heartbroken over this. And, um, and so my husband told me, he said, reach out to the family and, and ask, you know, so-and-so what you can do for her relative. And so I said, okay, you know, that's a good idea. And I've already made it known that I am not okay with crossing this name off. And so the secretary took that information and she shared it with a few people. And so this is working its way around the ward that I am supporting this family, that I'm taking sides. Um, and so I reach out to the Smith family and I tell this family member what the situation is and I and I tell the family member, you know, I don't really agree with how this is being handled. What can I do to get this, um, this girl to young women's? And she burst into tears and she told me everything that happened. It turns out So this that is another member of the Smith family. An immediate relative. Yes. Not the, not the 12 year old girl, but no. someone else. Mm -hmm. An immediate who, relative. Okay. Who was active at the time. Who is active. Who is active. Mm -hmm. And you're the finding only active out member. why was, why is this girl not, why is the, why is your family basically being mm -hmm. marginalized? And I, I didn't even ask that. I asked her specifically what I could do to get this girl to young women's because it was part of my calling to reach out to the inactive girls. And she burst into tears and she said, if you knew this girl, she said, you would not cross her name off. And she, you know, said that this was an incredibly sweet girl and she just spilled the beans on the situation. So the situation is not that he had adultery. It's that he, um, he drugged this, this girl who was 18 in their family. A member, a member of, the a Smith member family. of their family. So former mm -hmm. Bishop Young. Mm -hmm. drugs a girl who's in he the system. used yes he used his wife's medication to drug this girl he tied her up and he uh, he raped her and um the police were involved he um he ended up going to prison for this and he had a, a good lawyer that got him out on weekends so because he had young children um, so that he could work to provide for his family and then he would go back to prison during the week. Um, and so, uh, so the, the rumor was that uh, it was consensual and that rape was claimed to cover up consensual uh, sex, but that's not what the police felt after investigating the situation. But the ward didn't care. They, they thought, you know, a Bishop wouldn't do this. They called the family a bunch of liars. And I just have to clarify, this is a good family. I know this family, you know, the, the last remaining member that attends the church, she is a perfect example of elegance and poise. This is an incredible, good family. And, um, and we're and talking so, how many, how many members of this family oh, gosh. Stopped, stopped going to church? Like, Estimate. 
like a little over two dozen, almost three dozen members. So we're talking. So the ripple effect. Two or three dozen members mm-hmm. of this family ex- extended, all went inactive. One's went remaining inactive. active. Mm-hmm. She, the, she's your source. Mm-hmm. And they all went inactive at the expense of the ward's protection of yes. former Bishop Young. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, the ward right. loved him. They adored him. They still adore him. Uh, no one thought that a bishop would do this. Um, Is he super called... charming? Is he super oh, charismatic? yes. Of course. He's good looking. He works in sales, so he's a good talker. He's very educated with the gospel. So people love to listen to like his comments at church and he's a very smooth talker. He's very charming. Uh, and so people, they just love him and they, you know, they said he wouldn't do this. And so essentially this family was ostracized. You know, the, they would whisper about this family. This family doesn't understand the atonement. Um, and so, so he went to prison, he got out, uh, he was put on a sex offender's registry for a long time, he was excommunicated, and then he was rebaptized and had his blessings restored. Um, and then he was the ward mission leader for a while. Oh, and I just have to say, he, so, and that also wasn't the only member of that family that he had sexually abused. But the ward doesn't know about this. Because so there was, a, there was at least there one was, other member. There was one other member. She was not 18. She was younger than 18, and this went on for a while. But he was not convicted of that. No, and not a lot of members know about that because it's not something that the family talks about. So a a good amount of the ward is under the impression that it was just this 18-year-old girl. And I even had someone recently say, oh, but it's not pedophilia because she was 18. It's not as bad as pedophilia. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, this is how they kind of justify it to they put it in a box to make sense for them and so um, but there was an underage girl that was there was yes and it that was pedophilia because she was not 18 and um and so um so he was put on a registry and then he was made the ward mission leader uh, and he is very charming and very good talker, and he got three baptisms. And one of the converts had heard the rumors in the ward, and so she got online and she looked up his, um, his registry, and uh, she called out the leadership, and, and she said, you know, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites, uh, and all three of those converts left. And so I think that was kind of when the ward realized this isn't just a problem for him. This is a problem for us. And they love him. And he's related to about half of the family. Or excuse me, he's related to about half of the ward. Um, and so the wealthy it's, members. Well, it's got to be one of these wealthy dynastic mm-hmm. wards where the families have lived there for generations. Yes. They've all been yeah. leaders. And they're all loved yeah. and they all kind they of get look, rotated through the leadership. <laughs> and they all kind of look after yeah. each other. Yeah, exactly. Very I've much so. That. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so members uh, in the ward pulled together, uh, the wealthier members in the ward that love this family pulled together some money, uh, a lot of money to have him removed from the registry. And he was, the he sexual was removed. offender registry mm-hmm. for your state. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and so he was removed from the registry. And so I'm learning all of these details overnight. And, you know, this is a man that he participated in our son's baptism, you know, and when rumors started flying well, around the ward. Bishop Young did. Yes. Because yeah. you didn't know this. We didn't know. No. Uh-uh. Oh, no, yeah. Charming. Oh, I, oh, very much. And I loved him. I loved his family, his, uh, his children, and his wife worked with our kids in primary. You know, I had a sincere and genuine love for this family, and I still do. My opinion about him has definitely changed. Um, but, um, but, yeah, so, so I'm learning all of this, and, and uh, overnight my feelings change because he's a seminary teacher in our ward now. And so, and we have youth activities, and I know we have activities at his home because I was in the Young Women's Presidency, and, you know, I had been told going into the presidency that um, there were families in the ward that wouldn't allow their children to his home, and they were heavily criticized 
by the leadership for not having an understanding of the atonement. And so when I learned all of this, I was so angry and I was sad also because this is a good family that is being, I mean, any person with decency can see that this is wrong, this is not right. And, and they, they just adore him and they are so sensitive um, about this situation. No one talks about it, no one's allowed to talk about it. If you talk about it, you are heavily rebuked and reprimanded. Um, and, and so when I started reaching out to this, to the Smith family, um, I started getting comments from people at church and the, the gossip was going. I got an anonymous text message <laughs> from someone saying that I should kill my self-righteous self. And I, um, it had a bunch of random numbers, so there wasn't a way for me to, um, track it back to who sent it so i'm going to church was that, thinking was that scary what was that it, like? a little bit you know because i'm going to church thinking who sent me this awful message uh you know unsure of, of who sent this and um and i had also gotten a message from his from bishop young's daughter-in-law saying you know what what's going on all of a sudden you move back and and you know my father-in-law's past is being brought up apparently they're completely unaware that the entire stake talks about this that only our ward has this protection around him but the, the rest of the stake they think that this is a, a terrible thing and so you know she said um, she said his past is being brought up again and, and it's making him uncomfortable and I'm thinking to myself it's making him uncomfortable you know this is a this is altered lives you know this is affected lives and his past is making him uncomfortable you know i just i thought it's just so crazy the mentality that everyone has about this um do you have any sense for what it's been like for the victims to you know did from from the family member you spoke with do you have any sense for what it's been like for the victims to see bishop young loved and embraced by the ward while uh, while the Smith family has been marginalized. Do, do I, you have any idea how the victims are? I absolutely do because um, I don't, I'm not going to get into any details, but when I was younger, I went through a similar situation with a family member. And, you know, when I spoke up, the, I kind of received the same kind of, you know, oh, they, they love you, they wouldn't do that, you know, and so I very... Meaning and I your, abuser, your abuser yes. wouldn't abuse you. Yes, exactly. And so and I... What's that like? Fully, what's that like for the abused to be told that, that, you, that your abuser would never abuse you? I think first and foremost, it's confusing uh, because, you know, I know for me, I felt confused. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm telling you that this happened and you're telling me that it didn't happen. And so you don't, I don't think there's a way to understand, you know, I can't, I can't understand how their mentality surrounding this um, you know, but I know it's caused an incredible amount of hurt. And if anyone talks about this, they're spreading venom, they're spreading gossip, you know, they're not letting it go. And they don't realize that while this happened years ago, he was only just recently taken off about five, five or so years of the registry, five, five years ago. Um, but this little girl who was 12 years old, who wasn't even born at the time this was going on, her name is being crossed off because of a situation that happened years ago. And so it's just like this, this endless ripple effect. And I think the other thing is that our ward has such a, a high transition rate. And so this mentality gets transferred to the new families that move in. And so the details get lost because these details are no longer accessible as they would have been. Um, you know, we have another we have another young man in our ward who is on the sex offenders registry, and he had child porn on his computer. He didn't act on anything that we know of, but he had child porn on his computer. He is completely ostracized from. No one talks to him. He sits by himself every week. Um, 
but here you have this bishop who had this title and everyone loves him he's charming and it's just a whole different attitude that they have have around him um, and you know it's not the first time that i've seen that when i was in college there was a young man that i had went on a few dates with and um and he told me that he wanted to talk with me about something so that we could decide if we wanted to continue dating. And he said that when he, before he went on his mission, he was addicted to pornography. And he had gotten clean before he went on his mission. And while he was out on his mission, he started having pornography withdrawals. And he was over at a member's house with his companion. The companion was in the kitchen helping the family prepare dinner. And he was in the living room with their three-year-old daughter sexually abusing her. And he's telling her this story over dinner. And uh, he said he felt guilty about it. If he had not said anything, no one would have known. Uh, but he felt guilty about it. He went to his mission president. And instead of the mission president calling the family in, he called the church headquarters, he called church lawyers, and they circled the wagons, and then they called in the family. And they told the family what had happened, and they told the family, they, they encouraged them not to press charges because it was not the Christ-like thing to do. They said that they would deal with him appropriately, and um, they sent him home on, from his mission early, and they put him on a sex offenders registry. And so this is something, you know, this, everyone knows someone, everyone has some kind of crazy story, you know, along these lines. I have a friend in Idaho right now, her husband is a bishop, and they just had a student president that was uh, released because he was sexually abusing people, uh, children within his stake. And, um, you know, this is, this is a problem. And it's, it's something that is just brushed under the rug you know it just i i don't understand it i i don't understand it you know this is something that will affect that person's life it'll affect their sex life it'll affect their marriage it'll affect how they raise their children you know a lot of these people grow up to be helicopter parents um because they don't want those things happening to their kids i mean this is something that changes lives and it's just brushed away and I just, as it, you know, these aren't, these aren't feminist issues or LGBT issues or, you know, this is a human being issue. You know, this, it's a matter of treating people like human beings and, and, oh, the, the BYU, you know, the, the stuff going on at BYU right now with the, the sexual assault that's been going on for years. And, you know, it just. You mean where, where. Uh, specifically, which things are you referring to? Um, the victims being penalized regarding the honor code. Yeah, so you, so you're a victim of rape, and then you're mm -hmm. you're you're punished according to the honor code. Absolutely. Or disincentivized yeah. to report the rape because you're scared uh -huh. that if you do report the rape, then you will be punished according to the honor code. Absolutely. And the Salt Lake Tribune just received a Pulitzer Prize for their reporting on that topic. Yeah. But that was criticized as well. <laughs> right. And so, so, really, so really quickly, I just want to go back. So sure. I asked you this once before, and I just want you to be as explicit as you can. I, you, you said that it's confusing to the victims to have the perpetrators protected. What else do the victims feel and experience when the perpetrators are protected and honored? It's a punch in the gut. I mean, to be criticized because you can't sit in the room, the same room every Sunday, or because you can't send your kids to seminary to be taught by this man. I mean, I think, I think members sometimes confuse forgiveness with maintaining a relationship, and they overlap the two, and they don't realize that you can forgive someone without maintaining a relationship with them, and you shouldn't have to, and I think because these members can't, I think because the Smith family has a difficult time for good reason, um, you know, sitting in the same room with this man or seeing him be patted on the back and and you know giving compliments and about how amazing he is and being he, made seminary instructor over children you know yeah. over teenagers right it's like it doesn't matter like it didn't even happen um 
And so I just, I, my heart just breaks for this family because it's a, it's a good family. And to, to have to go through something like that, I just, you know, you ask me how I stay active. I have no, this, this woman's testimony is, is rock solid for her to continue to see this man every week. I just, I can't, you know, wrap my head around it. And what example does that send? Um, you know, I was talking with my husband about this, and I said, what, ex what example does that set for the youth? Because they see Bishop Young has done this terrible thing, and, you know, his life turned out okay. Everyone loves him. He's even got this great calling. He's going you know, to the what, temple again. Yeah, yeah, he's going to the temple. His family is, is restored. Um, you know, and so what message does that send to them that they can do something like this too and they'll be fine? And, you know, from a social economics perspective, uh, the church is just handling this all wrong. I mean, they could have, they could have kept it private, but what made it worse is justifying it, you know, oh, but it's not pedophilia because, because this person was 18, but you don't know about the other person that, that he had that he like abused 18 and, and drugged right yeah exactly yeah forget that he he tied her up and and drugged her you know it wasn't pedophilia so it wasn't as bad and when you're a parent in the ward essentially this might sound a little bit dramatic but essentially all the parents are robbed of the knowledge of you know protecting their kids and exactly you know, yeah and so he's now <laughs> in a role over children over teenage mm -hmm. kids so and what about the protection it's fine. what about yeah, the protection exactly. because we mm -hmm. know that it's very common for sexual abusers to reoffend to reoffend exactly and so by rushing to forgive him you know you're not only withholding information by taking it off the registry mm -hmm. by shaming people who talk about it you're withholding important information that parents, children, and you know adults all deserve to know. You're also putting him in positions where he's where he has the risk of reoffending. Exactly. Um, and by withholding the information, putting the people more at risk of of becoming victims, because you've not only put him in the position to reoffend, but you've also withheld the information from them. Exactly. And shamed anyone who talked about it mm -hmm. and pushed the victims out of the ward so they can't ever talk about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And yeah. one of the things that the members in this ward like to say is that, oh, well, this happened 18 years ago. But, you know, when you're a parent and you move into a new home, you know, the first thing that most of us do is we get on the registry to kind of see who lives around us. And I have had people that, you know, offended in the 80s or 90s, and I don't care because I still see them as someone that I need to protect my kids from. And, you know, when this was, um, when this was going on, I got curious and I, and I started looking things up as to what the probability was of him reoffending. And the first thing that popped up was a Harvard study. And in the study, it said that pedophiles and, and rapists, that this is a sexual appetite for them, that just like an alcoholic, this is going to be something that they have to be aware of for the rest of their life and that they can um, maintain it through therapy and medication. I can assure you that the bishops, they're not qualified to make that judgment. They're not looking up that research. What are the chances that Bishop Young will reoffend? They're not looking up that information. And then they go and they put him in these positions, like you said, to reoffend. And, um, you know, you're robbing the families the opportunity to protect their kids. And I had one member... <laughs> I had one member a couple of weeks ago, she said, well, I just like to believe that everyone has a good heart. And I'm thinking, I was, my husband and I were laughing about this because we're like, that's why Utah is the MLM capital of the country, because that is the cloud that they live on. They just want to believe that everyone has a good heart. And that's, that's not the reality that, that we live in. And then this is, what you have happen. This is, this is what happens. Right. And so I think one, you, you mentioned a difference between forgiveness and maintaining a relationship. Mm -hmm. I think it's also worth mentioning a difference between forgiveness and 
sort of accountability because oh, just because um, you can, you know, someone can in theory be forgiven or sort of like, okay, we can move on, but that doesn't mean they don't still need to pay maybe even for the rest of their lives for their mm -hmm. actions because yeah. the impact of what they've done has a literally eternal ripple effect. And yeah. so we shouldn't confuse forgiveness or at least acceptance of what someone's done and the fact that there's no reason why someone shouldn't always be aware of and subjected to the consequences and the accountability of, of their actions, maybe. Absolutely. And that's, that's what the church teaches. I mean, they, there's scripture. We have scripture about how bad this is, that if any of you offend these little ones, it'd be better that a stone be hung around your neck and you drown in the ocean. You know, this is not a little thing. And I was, a few weeks ago, I was listening to a conference talk, I think it was Elder Anderson, and he said, the atonement is great. He said, but there are going to be certain transgressions in life that are going to have lifelong consequences. And this is one of those things. And so, but the ward, they have just scooped this man up and have just put this protective bubble around him, you know, because the atonement is great. And this happened years ago. And, and so it just, it's an, it's a slap in the face to the victims. Um, and, you know, I think, um, I know we, we talked about this before, but I think it's important to talk about these things. You know, I think people should really start uh, speaking up about these things. I feel, um, I feel like in the church, it always seems to take someone pulling back that curtain before revelation is received. You know, um, Joseph Smith and Emma and the, the cigarette smoke, you know, as suddenly oh there's, yeah, suddenly there's a inspiration about the word of wisdom. You know, the blacks and the priesthood and the civil, civil rights movement, suddenly we have revelation. You know, the same-sex marriage issues in Hawaii, suddenly the church lawyers put out the proclamation of the family. We're told it's from President Hinckley, but really it was concocted by the church lawyers. Suddenly Suddenly we have this document saying, you know, this is the church's stance on, on same-sex marriage. The BYU sexual assault issues have been going on for years, and it took a national news story before a policy was put in place to protect the victims. You know, it just always seems like we're kind of behind the curve. And one of the things that you hear members say all the time is that, oh, well, they're men. But that's not good enough because as a convert, that's not the platter that the church is served up on. You know, as, as when missionaries go out and they're teaching these investigators, they're not teaching the investigators that these are men. They're teaching the investigators that these are men that are inspired of, of God and they receive direct revelation from Heavenly Father. That is the platter that the church is served up on. And yet we're always behind you know, the curve. It always takes some kind of incident before revelation is received. And I think that was another crack in my glass is just seeing these different things, you know, hearing about leaks from a, a website instead of hearing about tithing and the modest stipend uh, that is not so modest to a newly married couple or a third world member, you know, the modest stipend from a leak and not from my leaders, you know, the, the church, they have an honesty problem. You know, um, a few weeks ago, we had um, an activity in Young Women's and we had the parents there. And the secretary, she said something that just really, I felt like was a punch to the gut. She said, she's going over the values and she was saying, you know, where are you going to learn these things? And, and she said, you can't learn them anywhere else but young women's. And as I look around the room, it's all converts, you know, and we teach integrity, we teach honesty, and yet our leaders are not being honest. You know, we have the BYU essays that were very quietly released onto the church website, and half of our membership doesn't even know that they're there. Um, you know, there's just, it just always seems like we're, um, 
like we're behind the curve. And what's going to happen is that the church is going to see a massive dive in their membership numbers. Once the baby boomers are gone, you know, they are hemorrhaging millennials. I'm, I'm like the last year for the, for the millennia, millennials. And it's, um, you know, at a general conference, they said, it's a simple, it's a simple math equation. At general conference, they said that we have 30,000 wards in the, in, in the world, in the church, we have 30,000 wards. Now, if you consider that the average ward has about 100 active members, and in foreign countries, that's even less, less members, if you consider that there's about 100 active members per ward, times that by 30,000, you have 3 million. We have 3 million active members when we know that our total membership is 15 million. Four times the amount of members are inactive. You know, I had a 14-year-old girl in Young Women's a few weeks ago, and she asked about Joseph Smith's wives, and the president said, nope, that didn't happen. And what happened with this girl is that she had a friend at school pull it up on his cell phone in the hallway on the way to class. You know, I don't think that these, that the brethren who are from a different generation realize that we are in a world of technology, that these kids have access to all of these facts that they're on their way to class on their cell phones. And, you know, after the baby boomers are gone, they're going to see they're, they're, they're not able to retain their millennials. And so it's just, because they're not transparent and they're not being honest about so many different things. And so it's just, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I just want to note, um, again, I've talked about this before is it shows this weird set of priorities for the church, because if you're, if you fall, if you're gay and you can't change uh, yes. and you fall in love with another man, and you choose to have a monogamous, committed, loving, legal yeah. marriage, you're an apostate and you're forever unwelcome at the church again. Forever, yeah. right? And your kids yeah. can't get baptized. If, you're yeah. a, if, you, if you drug and rape one woman and then sexually abuse another teenager, you can be uh, baptized. Yeah, you'll, yeah you'll, you'll, you'll get, you know, maybe you'll get excommunicated, maybe. But you can certainly, if you have power and status and influence and charm, you can, you can eventually get rebaptized. You can retain full fellowship again, go back to the temple, get all your blessings restored. All your kids can, can remain because members. Because it never happens. Yeah. yeah and, and you can be honored um, as if nothing ever happened. And mm -hmm. it just shows this really strange, almost perversion of priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, where where legal monogamous committed love law is, abiding citizens is an apost is apostasy mm -hmm. um but but rape and drugging people and pedophilia is is sort of a a relative slap on the hand and you're right back in exposed to children again and i i have to wonder if subconsciously we know that joseph smith abused his power to to become sexually involved with women we know that he that we know that he verbally abused women who ever dared admit that that he sexually approached them or misused his power we know that he was predatory on children and so i wonder if that makes us more forgiving of sexual offenders and of child abusers because the founder of our church was sexually predatory and a child abuser. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How could, that, an, how could that not make us more lenient, right? That was a huge issue for me with this whole issue with the bishop, um, was the LGBT policy. I had already had an issue with the LGBT policy, but this just brought it to the forefront for me. Um, you know, I have... Um, I have a sister-in-law who is gay, and she is amazing. And, um, you know, her kids will never be allowed to be baptized. And so 
I really struggled with that when I saw this, when I learned that this man had done these heinous things, these terrible, awful things, and here he's allowed to be rebaptized and have his blessings restored. And here my law-abiding sister-in-law, you know, if she ever decides to adopt or, or have children, that they will never be allowed to be baptized in the church until they're 18. And even then, it has to be approved by the First Presidency. I just, like I said, these aren't civil rights issues. These are human being issues. You know, it's about treating people like human beings. And I just... I just don't understand. I, I just don't understand. And I, the brethren are going to realize is, you know, in the next decade or two, that more and more people are feeling comfortable being open about their sexuality. It's going to reach a point where everyone knows someone that is gay. And these policies you know, these don't just affect the person that is gay. This affects their family. You know, I love my sister-in-law. I'm not okay with this policy. Everyone knows someone, and it's going to affect them in a different way, and they're going to lose a lot of people. And, and that was one of the things for me that kind of shattered my shelf is that, you know, this, this just doesn't sound like a loving a loving heavenly father. So for me, it was this issue with the bishop. And then oddly enough, at the same time that this situation was going on with the bishop, I got online one day to put on a, a show for my kids. Those darn ball guppies. <laughs> um, I put on a show for my kids and there was a video in the feed of uh, the sidebar. It was an I'm an ex-Mormon video and I don't usually watch those. And I think his name is Chris Johnson um, and he's amazing. But, um, but he, in this video, he said something that I felt was very profound and he said, um, he said, when something is true, it can be tested forward, sideways, and backwards, and it will still be true. And he was saying how you can't do that with the church, that we have these mound of, this mound of facts, you know, at our fingertips. These aren't mommy blogs. These are renowned historians and, and, and artifacts, and this is all factual information that we have showing that the church is just another church. And then we've got one warm, fuzzy feeling, and the members are like, I think I'll take that. And so, you know, he's going over this, and I'm like, yeah, that is so true. But then he, he, start, he showed like a dozen clips of different people from different religions. And, um, you know, they're all bearing these heartfelt, tearful testimonies of how their church is true and how Heavenly Father told them that their church was true. And these are Seventh-day Adventists, Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons, Catholics. And I tell you, it was literally that moment that my shelf broke because I, the thought occurred to me, well, wait a minute, if Heavenly Father, why is Heavenly Father telling these people that their church is true when my church is supposed to be true? And as soon as that question popped in my head, it was like something broke inside of me. And I, you know, I, I knew, and, you know, the, the honesty issue, um, you know, the, all of this happened um, at the same time for me. And um, that Sunday, I went to church and I had ward council in the morning. And then I had, I was asked to say a prayer and sacrament. And then I had to teach a combined lesson in young women's. And then I had a presidency meeting and then I had BYC. And I was excruciating. I knew, I was sitting there in ward council before church. And I knew that a switch had been turned off, that the floodgates were open and there was no closing them. I could not unknow the things that I, that I knew, that I had learned. You know, polygamy was an, always an issue for me from when I joined the church. I found out after I joined the church and I went to my BYU bishop and he said, and he laughed at me and he said, so what are you going to do if it's true? Leave the church? And I thought, well, I guess not. And so that was something that was always on my shelf. And then you learn about the 14-year-old the women 
uh, or the 14 year old girls and that they have names and you learn about you know that that Emma Smith wasn't even because he was so dishonest with his wife she wasn't even the first woman that he was sealed to she was like the 22nd or 23rd I mean all of these facts are at our fingertips and they're in the church essays you know this is an anti-Mormon literature these are facts and um and so for me it was it was I, I couldn't turn that clock back. I couldn't unknow the things that I learned and I confided in a friend and um, my friend Mary and she's like, well, have you heard of John DeLynn? And I was like, oh, is she gonna you know, tell me about some anti-Mormon literature? And I did, I, I, I watched, my first podcast that I watched was Tom Phillips. And I remember coming home from my run in the morning as his podcast was finishing and sitting in front of my garage and it occurring to me, it really hitting me, you know, when you listen to his, his pain over his family and, you know, what this has all done for him, it really occurred to me the choice that I was making, the severity of the choice that I was making, what I could lose, that I could lose my marriage, that I could lose my family. And so, and then the other podcast I listened to was Eric Reeves, and I felt like I listened to his right at the right time, because in it he said, you know, you don't have to be Mormon to be a good person. And I needed to hear that, because I was still, you know, anytime I thought, what am I going to do now? Now that I know these things, what am I going to do? How am I going to raise my children? I was very much a subscriber to that fear that I couldn't raise my children without the church. And, um, you know, the church teaches us that everything starts in the home. And they even tell you, like, don't, don't bring your kids to church expecting us to teach them the, the gospel. That has to be, you teach them everything they need to know in the home. But then when you try to leave the church, then they say, oh, but how are you going to raise your kids without us? How are you going to raise your kids without the church? And I'm like, wait a minute, you said that you know, everything starts in the home. And so I... That's kind of where I'm at now. I don't, I think, um, I think it's been instilled in a lot of us that the church has this monopoly on God, you know, and you see it with a lot of people that leave the church um, that have been born and raised in the church and they come to this realization that the church is just another church and they ditch everything and they think, well, if the church isn't true, then God mustn't be true. And I felt like the advantage that I had that I had was that I was a convert. And so for me, Heavenly Father existed in my life long before the church did. And I was having spiritual experiences long before I was a member of the church. And so, you know, the church does not have a monopoly on God or your, you know, whatever relationship you have. And so, I don't know, just so many issues. Yeah, uh, no, it's so difficult. Um, Let me ask you this. So, sure. So first of all, um, I've had some people write in and just say, what if he's, what if he's innocent? Um, what, if, what if he really didn't do it? What if the members of the ward got his name off the, and this is, this, is the, this is the classic, this is what I hate about this topic because immediately um, you have to ask, what if, you know, okay, so let me just give you an example. I, I, I have been falsely accused of things, right? So like I published on Facebook just a couple of weeks ago, there's some institute teacher in Tucson, Arizona, Arizona. right? That's mm -hmm. telling his students that John DeLynn is estranged from his own children, that his wife lets him sleep around with other women. Um, and that, that, you know, whatever, like awful false rumors, right? And mm -hmm. so I... Um, and there's no truth to any of that. I'm in daily contact with all my children. Marky would never let me be unfaithful. And um, I'm, we're happily married. And, uh, and so th there is this thing about false, being false accused. And it always is going to be brought up anytime that there's uh, a rape allegation. Having said Sorry. that, having said that, um, I know for a fact that uh, so many uh, legitimate ra rapists go completely unprosecuted because victims um, fear that they won't believe, be believed in court, that they won't have a good enough lawyer in court, and that they'll just get shamed and their name will be smeared. And the, 
the perpetrator will be let off and then they'll be their name will have been dragged to the mud they will have spent all this money and nothing would have happened and so i know for a fact that rape happens i know for the fact that they say that in utah like one in three women uh will be raped or sexually abused it's everywhere but at the same time um rapists get off and people are scared to come forward um but we still have the issue of you know what about false accusations so if someone were to say to you what if you got your facts wrong what if this guy is innocent and what if the people who fought to get his name off the sexual registry were trying to trying to you know restore the honor of a falsely accused man what would you say to that sure. um well we grew up here and so we know these families and, um, you know, this was all factual. This was all, uh, there was an investigation done. This man went to prison, you know. He went to actual prison for this. He was excommunicated for like 15 years before they allowed him to be rebaptized. You know, so those aren't, um, you know, and, and like I said, again. So he was found guilty in a court of law yeah, and by the church. and in the church, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. and, and like I said, we know this family, you know, the the Smith family, and they're a good family. You know, my husband grew up with these people, and he was best friends with Bishop Ye Bishop Young's um, son. And, um, you know, so I feel like we have a good enough, yeah. good enough information to know, you know, th this was investigated by the proper authorities, right, and right. they found him guilty. And so. I just want to, th this is difficult because I never want – like, like I'm, my motive is to get out in the open the fact that rape happens, Absolutely. sexual assault happens. Um, but I, but I ask these questions because it's important that we model talking about these issues. I know there are going to be victims advocates that are like, John, you're, you're, you're totally asking the same bad questions. You're modeling <laughs> this bad behavior, but mm -hmm. I want us to talk about it and to practice talking about it and to get the difficult complex issues out in the open yeah. because that's what we have to do. Okay. Yeah. So what is, so what about this idea? We've talked about this already. I'm just going to ask it again. What's your sure. motive? Because, you know, like, yes, yes, it's been difficult for the victims. Yes. The, the man has paid his time. He's been punished by the church. He's, he's, he's paid, you know, he's been to prison. Why not just let it go now? Why not just say, Everyone, it's, it's water under the bridge. Uh, yeah, it's terrible, but it's time to just kind of move on. Why would sure. you want to bring this up um, now? Because they want, they want to move on for him. They don't care about, you know, they're still ostracizing this family. You know, like I said, they're, they're crossing the name off of this 12-year-old girl who wasn't even born yet. You know, she is being ostracized, and she didn't even have anything to do with this. She wasn't born when this was going on. So this is still going on. This mentality, they're still digging this in. You know, this was just a, a few months ago that I was told that this family doesn't understand the atonement. So this is a mentality about this family that is being perpetuated. And, and that's not right. You know, when you see your kid being beaten up on the playground, do you just stand and watch? Or do you say, hey, that's not okay. And, and you know, I just, as a mother, I just, you know, and as someone who empathizes with this family, and knows that they're a good family, I just don't think that anyone deserves that. I don't think, I think she should be able, this family should be able to come to church and, and you know, practice their beliefs just like he does. And, and that's the other thing about this man, is that he knows, he knows that there are about three dozen people that are not coming to church because of him. He knows that, and he stays. And to me, that's almost a little bit arrogant. Um, when you know that you're keeping that many people from coming to church, why not move? Like, why not go to a different ward so that other people can come and, you know, practice their beliefs? But he, he doesn't. He is comfortable. He, I don't think he cares. 
uh, he knows that he's loved, he knows that he's adored in this ward. Um, you know, he's got family in this ward. Um, and so I just, you know, you, when you see something that is not right, you know, and I think that was the other reason why I was so passionate about this is because I've seen how adamant our stake is, our ward is about just brushing this away and completely, you know, when this stuff was going on with this family, a few, the Smith family a few weeks ago, I had to call the bishop and ask him to go and see this woman because I said, she is going to leave. We're going to lose the last member of the Smith family over this situation. And so it wasn't until I called him that he went to go and visit this family. And that's just the mentality that it's, it's wrong. Like what, what other reason is there? It's wrong. It's not right. It's not okay to, to victim shame and victim blame. It's just, it's not right. So we need to stop punishing the victims. We need mm -hmm. to talk openly about things. People deserve mm -hmm. the information to be made safe. Um, and the church needs to learn how to handle sexual abuse cases far mm -hmm. more effectively and stop protecting uh, abusers at the expense of victims and stop protecting abusers at the expense of the members and their mm -hmm. own safety, right? Yeah. Yep, exactly. So that's that's why you're speaking out. Yes, exactly. And um, you know, I put in I put in my resignation papers to the church um about a week ago. And um, you know, I'm I'm okay with that. And um my husband, he I was <laughs> I was incredibly nervous about um going to my husband with my faith crisis because my husband has always served in state presidencies and local leadership positions and he's a very devout member and you know we I sat him down and we had a very emotional conversation about you know what I believe and I think part of him blames this ward because <laughs> he's like you've stuck through so much and you're gonna give up now and but he doesn't understand that this this just happened to happen at the same time that I was learning other things about the church and you know essentially I told him I said I, I took a peek down the rabbit hole and I fell in <laughs> and uh, you know I just I can't um, you know my husband's a good man he has a the heart he has a heart the size of Texas and, and, um, you know, we've always been just had, I know it sounds so silly, but we've always been head over heels in love with each other. And, and, um, he loves me more than he loves the church. And just knowing that is enough. You know, I told him, uh, I told him that I didn't ever want him to feel like we were going in different directions. And I said, I will always be pointed in the direction that you're going and I will support you in, in whatever you believe. And, and just him knowing that, he has been incredibly supportive and uh, he's got a few cracks in his shelf, um, but he's just been uh, incredibly supportive. And through all of this, I, I feel like I've fallen in love with my husband a second time because when we got married, I saw him as this priesthood holder and I saw him as this just, you know, authoritative, just this amazing person. <laughs> but now I see him for who he is. He's a, he's a good husband. He's a good father. You know, he's a leader in his professional life. He's got a good heart. And um, it's it sounds funny, but this has actually brought us even closer than, than what we were. Um, and so I'm, I'm, ready to close that door and we've compromised on a lot of things and we're just going to move forward from here. Do you, looking back, you were, you were a foster child. Um, mm -hmm. you, the church caught you at a very vulnerable time. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you, uh, do you regret having been raised in the church? Do you regret giving so much of your life to the church? Are you at peace with it? Do you see it as good and bad? I see it as a little bit of good and bad. I think, you know, um, you know, like I said, Kristen Benyon, I needed that. I needed to hear the things that she said to feel like a good person again. You know, I felt like I was less than everyone else when my husband and I got married uh, because I hadn't practiced abstinence and I just always felt less. 
And, um, you know, but, and I was telling my husband this the other day and he said, but you got me out of this. And I was like, Oh yes, I did. And so, you know, there definitely perks and, and, just because you leave the church, it's unfortunate that people think that you're lost and that you leave because you're offended. You know, it's not that you learn that it's just a church, but um, you take what is good. You know, we still do family home meeting every week, but instead of learning about Joseph Smith, I teach my kids about being honest and doing good things for other people. And um, you take what's good. I'm taking funeral potatoes and, um, you know, I'm taking the, the morals that I was taught and, and the values and, and the service. And you leave all the other stuff that you learned was not true. Okay. So, so overall, it was hard. I came out on top, I think. <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. Are you, are you at all worried about how the ward members uh, are going to treat you now? Um, well, there, there's a lot of people that are going to be upset. Uh, if when they find out about this podcast, there's, uh, it's going to offend probably my entire ward. Um, but you know what? At the end of the day, I I feel that I did a good thing. I spoke up for someone that didn't have a voice and, and I'm okay with that. And we are, we're on our way out of this ward anyways. Um, we're in the process of moving right now. Um, sorry, this is my phone. Um, but um, I feel at the end of the day, I stuck up for what was right. And, and sometimes when you stand up for what is right, it doesn't make you a popular person, but it does give you a clean conscience and uh so i'm okay with that okay well we've had a wonderful following online i uh, just want to let you know that we've had over five thousand views um this has been shared at least uh 20 times and uh six it says sixty two thousand people reached so far so um, I think that this is already starting to make its ripple and I just can't thank you enough actually for being willing Absolutely. to talk about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to thank all our listeners who have made comments along the way. Uh, we have tons and tons of comments. We've really appreciated the listeners uh, uh, engaging there. People are sending you thank yous, telling you how brave they feel you are, how courageous this is. Um, Several people have commented how they've, they've seen the similar types of cover-ups in their own wards and in their own stakes, yeah. that victims are always um, sort of like uh, put at a lower status than the abusers. And there's yeah. a really good comment by Gina Colvin that I think I wanted to read out. She says, they, the leaders, aren't vested in protecting victims. They're protecting themselves, the leaders, church. and the church first. Anything yeah. that upsets the fab fabric of leadership is the greatest uh, sin in the church. You can yeah. abuse children, but while you still support the leaders, you are all in and loved. The minute yeah. you point the finger rightly at our leadership, they will bring hell down on you. And that's from the wise yeah. Dr. Gina Colvin. I don't think we can argue with Dr. Colvin. What do you think? <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Ashley, I just want to thank you for coming on Mormon Stories. I can't believe Absolutely. you've made... Yeah, I can't believe you've made this progress in one month. Like, that's I don't a, know if that's a good thing. That's crazy. But do you know what? Slow down, slow down. No, but do you know what? You know, the podcasts were a tremendous, tremendous help. And then um, the ex, the ex Mormon Reddit site, that was incredibly helpful. I mean, you need something when you are going through this transition. And there is even. <laughs> There was even some things that I was reading to my husband the other night from the Reddit, you know, about clapping in church and rapping in church. And we were both laughing so hard. And I told my husband, I said, these are the people that the leaders say are disgruntled, that are angry, you know, that are, were offended. And I said, look, they're just normal, regular people that had questions. And so I love the ex-Mormon Reddit group. You know, it, 
it, they're just normal people, you know, they're just normal people that had questions and came to the same realizations that you did. And so reaching out and finding that support was huge for me. And, um, you know, like I told you, once, once you know, once you come to these realizations and you learn about this, that our roots are not what we were told they were, what, what other choice is there? You know, what, what do you do? I tried going to church and I was sick. I couldn't, I knew that I knew that I was done, but I couldn't, I couldn't turn back that clock. And so, you know, you move forward and, you know, I told my husband, I said, I'm still the same person. You know, I, I don't really have a desire to go out and drink or, um, you know, cigarettes or, yuck uh no offense to anyone that enjoys cigarettes but um you know i'm still the same person i'm a mother i still value you know the speaking clean and um you know i'm i'm still the same person and um you know it's it's been a good thing but it's been a good thing because of the support that i was able to get well uh we're so happy to have played a small part in your journey absolutely and- but more importantly, we're so grateful that you had the courage to speak up on a very important issue. Um, we, you know, I'll just say we tried hard to be respectful. We didn't mention people's names. We didn't even mention the state where this has happened. We did that as a way to address the issues, talk about the system, but not shame people um, mm-hmm. I- I- as much as we could. Um, and uh, there, there's people who have already written, Ashley, that they think this podcast is going to save lives. So thank you. so much for your courage and being willing to talk about it absolutely absolutely all right thanks so much john oh yeah my pleasure i'll just mention that um that uh again thanks to the live listeners for joining us on facebook we want to thank everyone who supports us also just through the podcast and everyone else on youtube want to make sure people know that this couldn't happen without the generous support uh, of people who donate to Mormon Stories or the Open Stories Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and so all your donations are tax deductible. We're transparent in our finances, and everything you donate goes to support this type of programming, the staff, and the mission of the OSF. So please continue supporting us. Uh, we will continue doing things like this. If you go to mormonstories.org, there's a little donate button. You can click on it. You can designate how much you want to donate monthly. Monthly donations help us sort of have a budget and predict what we can, uh, what we can invest in in terms of a staff and resources to make this information more available to others. So if any of you love these programs, if you benefit from them, if you enjoy them, if, if you believe in what, what uh, we do, please make a tax deductible donation. And we promise to use your money to alleviate the suffering caused by religious transitions, both in Mormonism and without. Uh, please comment on our blog, mormonstories.org. If anybody wants to share their experiences of, uh, of abusers being glorified and protected and of victims being marginalized, we'd love to see those comments on mormonstories.org. Um, and again, if you guys have a great story you want to share, please share it. The final thing I'll say is that um, we have various events coming up on our calendar. You can go to mormontransitions.org slash events or the event calendar you can find on the menu at Mormon Stories. We've got a Fort Collins, Colorado event, May 4th through 5th. We've got Dallas, Texas, July 7th through 8th. Uh, We've got um, a mixed faith retreat happening in Salt Lake City, Utah County, um, August 11th through 12th. We're coming to Seattle, September 14th and 15th. And we're trying to come to Australia, October 20th through 22nd. For those of you who, uh, are willing to register for that event. We want to thank Amy Grubbs of the Open Stories Foundation and Cody Layton for making all this possible along with the OSF board. So I just have to always make those comments because we couldn't do this without the OSF and those that support us. So again, um, Ashley, to you, to your wonderful husband, to the victims who have spoken out, um, thank you so much again. And please, please join us again on Mormon Stories.